and I'm definitely interested in hearing it. So here uh, is Uzma. I'm an addict, my name is Usma. Listen, right from the start, turn to somebody close to you and give them a nice, big, heartfelt, juicy hug. Once again, I'm an addict and my name is Usman. <clears throat> and thank you so much for hugging someone close to you. It's a good way in commemoration of the theme of this convention to practice unity. And um, it's also a good way to practice humility, which is not me thinking less of myself, but thinking of myself less, you know. I wanna begin by thanking the Creator God so much for everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I believe that God is the answer to every question. Following that, I want to thank Narcotics Anonymous. <clears throat> I want to thank Narcotics Anonymous because I'm, I'm, I'm just crazy madly in love with Narcotics Anonymous. So I always thank God for his divine intervention, his unmerited favor, otherwise described as grace for bringing me here and always thank Narcotics Anonymous in turn for bringing me back to the God of my understanding. You know. I also want to thank the Tri-Dade Area Convention for this speaking opportunity and in particular I want to thank Rukaya for the work and effort that she put in to making this such a beautiful convention. It's warm, you've got excellent speakers. I really want to emphasize how much I appreciate her and her efforts because I've had occasion to do quite a bit of speaking and have come in contact with many, many, many programming chairs and um, I think she tops the list in terms of her concern, her sensitivity and the way in which she engages in selfless service work. So one more time, give a nice big hand. I want to thank all the speakers who spoke before me um, and there have been so many, I can't name you all individually but it's a beautiful thing when when, when, when you're, you're, you're asked to speak and you have speakers who speak before you and you get to draft or ride that energy. You know, before you speak, you get to sit there and get buoyant, get lifted up, get your spirit raised, get your consciousness lifted by the preceding speakers who speak before you. Uh, my topic, my topic is a topic I've had occasion to speak on my topic is a topic I've had occasion to speak on before without this ringing noise I uh, spoke on it in Detroit the topic by the way is pain is inevitable but suffering is optional. And in fact, that's how I got to be here in, 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 in Florida. Someone heard me speak, people heard me speak on it in Detroit and they thought that it might be nice if I, if I addressed or treated the same topic. Now I need to say by way of disclaimer, it's a rare thing that I can give you the same person that spoke on one occasion on another separate discrete occasion. There are just so many variables and factors that play into what make you say and be the person you are on a given setting that it is difficult, if not impossible, to transplant that. Even though you have the same person up here, please don't sit there and say, that that's just quite not how he did it in Detroit. <laughs> All right? So we could just get that out of the way. I'll try to, in the interest of um, what? I don't know, continuity, give you as much of that person as I can recall 
but if my spirit takes me another way, I'm going that other way because that's the way I've asked God for help, in other words. You know, I asked him to be my help, and, and I know when my help comes, and I know how to, 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 to just ride God, so to speak. You know, when he comes and moves me out the way, I find it to be an excellent thing, you know. So I don't really worry about, you know, being concerned with, are you getting what you think you might have been supposed to get? I just go with the flow, and so that's what we're going to do. But I do remember some of the things that I did when I did speak in Detroit, and, 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 and a couple of those things I want to do this time, too. You know, I want to, I want to uh, kind of approach the topic in a similar vein, you know. Um, and, and, and to do that, I want, to, I want to tell a little story that I told in Detroit. And it's a story, I'm going to tell two stories during this qualification, and one one story was about a, 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 a guy who was a seeker. He was seeking truth and knowledge and inspiration, and that was the most important thing to him. He wasn't so caught up in money, property, prestige, or anything like that, or relationship. He just wanted to know the meaning of life, and that was what fueled him every day. That's what woke him up and drove him, you know. And he, he asked any and everybody he could find, where, where, where can I find the meaning of life? And in, and in that quest, he was guided to go way around the other side of the globe and they told him that on the top of this mountain over there all the way up at the top there's the wisest man that was ever known and if but it's a torturous uphill journey to reach him you know very few people ever even make it to the top to see him let alone pose the question you want but if you can make it up there there you stand a good chance of learning what is the meaning of life so he embarked on that journey and and it was rough. And he, he went up the hill and he'd fall back down and try again and he'd get scraped and bruised and cut. And, and when he finally did make it to the top of the mountain, he saw the little grizzled old wise man and he said, are you the little wise man? He said, yes, I am. He said, they told me that I could come and find the meaning of life if I asked you the question. He said, little old wise man, what is the meaning of life? Whereupon the little old wise man promptly turned around and knocked the shit out of him. And he... <laughs> He fell all the way back down to the bottom of the hill. He said, damn. I know this is a this is this is a test. This is a little old wise man test. He wants to know if I'll keep coming back before he gives me the answer to my burning question, what is the meaning of life? He wants to see if if, if I'm deserving of that answer. So I see what to do here. I need to just keep coming back. So once again he made it up to the top of the mountain you know, with great difficulty. And again, he posed the same question to the little old man and he got this exact same result. The man knocked him right back down the hill. Three more times, he had the same result. He tried the same thing, he got the same result. One last time, he said, I'm gonna try it one more time. And he went up and he made it back to the top of the hill. And uh, he asked the little old man the meaning of life and the little old man turned and as was his habit, he swung on him, but this time the guy ducked and the punch went over his head. And the little old wise man said, very good. You are well on your way now to learning the meaning of life. Now you know the first lesson you need to know, which is that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, <laughs> right? And. Uh, that's a particularly poignant story if you're an addict. Because if you're anything like me, right? Just learning that took me 38 years. Right? I came to recovery in 1988. I was born in 1950. And it took me 38 years just to learn that simple lesson that pain was inevitable but suffering is optional now i don't want to uh take liberty and just presuppose because you know recovery is such a tricky deal that even little words have other meanings right huh if you go if you go to some I don't know, if you go to certain places and people say, nice to have you keep coming back, they mean one thing. When we hear 
your drunk ass share and we say keep coming back. We mean something different. You understand what I'm saying? Same words, same words, same language, completely different here, right? Well, how did I do? Well, you, you really need to just keep coming back. Oh, they love me. They love me. When you knew, you say, well, they, they just love me. How do you know this? Well, they told me to keep coming back. The whole meeting said keep coming back. You know? so, so you can't just suppose that just because you, you have some sort of a familiarity with a word or because it's a small word that you necessarily understand the meaning of it. You know? So I don't even want to take liberty with pain. So I, I was in position earlier to, uh, to borrow Kadam Ali's uh, Little Webster Dictionary. And uh, I want to run through some definitions I looked up because this will set up where I want to go with this. All right? I looked up pain, and pain said, pain is an unpleasant feeling or hurting arising from injury or disease or distress. See, hurt. I looked up hurt. Hurt said, distress and anxiety caused by suffering or misfortune or injury. See, injury. <laughs> Injury said to commit an offense or wrong. See, wrong. Wrong said a violation of a moral, social, or spiritual code or something that is not correct or something that is contrary to law or conscience, principle or law, or to be an error. See, error. Error said to be involved in a deviation from reality. Here we go. Reality said, A, the totality of everything that exists, or B, God. Hmm. So, so that kind of gives you where I'm trying to go with this. I want to give you a sense of how I wound up in error. I wound up deviating from God, right? I began to engage in codes of conduct, principle, or behavior that was contrary to God, right? I can't stand here and say that that was the case for me my entire life. I do recall being what in what they described as the Edenic state, feeling like someone who was in the bosom of the Garden of Eden as a little youngster. I do recall my mother joining me in a ritual where we every night collectively talked in terms of now I lay me down to sleep, right? Now I lay me down to sleep. And now I lay me down to sleep worked for me for a long time, at least up until at least the age of five. I was just a happy little youngster, you know? I don't, I don't subscribe to a, a dysfunctional home. I was the most dysfunctional thing my home had ever seen. I was a new level of dysfunction, you know? I mean, I came from people who had toted that barge, lift that bell, picked that cotton, and never shot drugs, or smoked a pipe or anything else, you know? Uh, and uh, they had, by and large, suffered much more than I, but um, when I came along, I was for a time a happy little kid. And when I say happy, I mean happy in the sense of being happy for no particular reason, kind of happy. You know, still very, very much in tune with now I lay me down to sleep, believing that all was right in God's world. Everything was good, just, and as it was supposed to be. Happy for no particular reason type happy did not need outside invalidation to make me happy. Happiness not predicated or dependent upon your validation. Completely self-contained and capable of being happy in my own right. Didn't need friends type of happiness. Did not matter whether I was by myself or in the company of others. The happiness that you have before you buy into certain things like comparison. Before you start comparing your hand that you have to play to other people's hands. 
the happiness that you have before you even begin to think in terms of lack of self-acceptance, before you make a decision to seek your acceptance from others outside of you, from situations, events, and circumstances outside of you, where you have complete self-acceptance and everything like that. Somewhere along the line, the best I have been able to track it using these steps and traditions and principles through an A is back to the, about the age of five, it's there that I first think I got a glimpse of my stepping outside of the warm embrace of God. It's there that I think I first picked up the notion of living in error. Living in what I've now come to see through Narcotics Anonymous in a manner which states that God was not my greatest source of strength and courage. I thank God much for Narcotics Anonymous because through the principles of Narcotics Anonymous there's hope for me because prior to coming here, because I'm a full tilt boogie 24-7 variety of an addict, there's an endless amount of ways in which I can get outside of the will of God. The most obvious way of course is with drugs, right? But one of the deepest revelations that I had in this whole journey of recovery has been the fact that I haven't used drugs since 1988 and I have on a consistent basis come to understand how much work it takes to really truly be God reliant. It takes a lot of work to learn how to unlearn. It takes a lot of work to learn how to destroy a lot of the old negative tapes that I had come to buy into up to the time I came to Narcotics Anonymous, right? And, and in order to do so, I needed a great deal of help, you know? We talk about pain being inevitable. The inevitability piece of this thing is, as long as I am outside of the will of the Creator, my pain is inevitable. It's just a question of how long I'm going to endure that particular pain. But as long as I am outside of the will, now I can slice and dice it and color it and do whatever I explain it, rationalize it, stay in denial, refusal, or whatever I want to do. But as long as I am outside, living outside of the will of the God of my understanding, pain is inevitable. I don't care what kind of icing I put on the cake, pain is inevitable. I can convince me and maybe even manage to convince you that how I'm living, what I'm doing, what I'm feeling is all right and I'm all right with it. But as long as I'm living outside of the will of the Creator, pain is inevitable. There's just no getting around that, you know? And so when I got here to this program, it was a blessing. It was a blessing for me to first, for the first time, I'm telling you, in 38 years, have a mechanism to have me address all the pain that I put myself into. Mm, wonder why, one of the reasons is this. How about, how about, how about you become so practiced at premeditatively with forethought, putting yourself in painful situations that the pros listen to what I'm saying, that the prospect of doing right seems wrong. Can you relate to having done wrong, living outside of the will of God for so long? I'm not talking about being ignorant, because I told you I had a good background and good home training but still with full knowledge, having practiced living outside of the will of God for so long that the prospect of doing right seems wrong. To where the people who love you the most, family members, your blood relatives, can only, when your name comes up, shake their head and say, mm, mm, mm. I remember, I remember going to a relative's house and at the end of the road when I was just 
dusted, busted, and totally disgusted, and, and I had to eat something because, you know, I was tired of a meal, a full meal, being a pack of Little Debbies in a 25 cent colored juice. I was tired of a full meal being a bag of potato chips or if it was a holiday barbecue chips. I was tired. And I wanted some real food and I went to a relative's house and I knocked on the door and, and, and I remember them looking and, and debating whether or not to open the door. I remember standing there saying, what? Don't you see it's me? And I remember listening to the whisperings going, you know it's him. Should we let him in? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Let's call some people. <laughs> well, let's, well, let's at least uh, let somebody know that he's here. Because we don't know what the hell he's into. You know? And I remember them letting me in. And, and I was sharing about this the other day. You know that, like, you know, I had an accident. So I go to the chiropractor. And when you go there, you, if anybody had been in an accident, you go to the chiropractor. And before they treat you, they take you in the room. And they lay you on this nice little bench. And they put these little electrodes on your back. And then they put the heat back on. And then they turn on the timer. And you stay there and you get your treatment for as long as the timer is ticking. When, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the end of my active addiction, when I used to go see relatives, they'd let me in, but they'd turn on their own form of a timer. You know, I'd be let in, but I'd be put on a timer. And I remember coming in and I said, could you just give me something to eat? They said, well, we didn't expect you. I said, this, it doesn't matter. I'm not asking you, you understand what I'm talking about, the type of desperation where I'm not asking you to warm shit up. You don't have to warm up. It doesn't have to mix and match. It doesn't have to be a balanced meal. You don't even have to nuke it. Just put some shit on a plate and give it to me. And I'll go down in the basement and be all right with it and just chill out for a minute. Turn on the timer and let me go down the basement, eat my cold ass food, and I'll be all right after a while. And I get out there and get some more pain. So I took my little plate of cold ass, non mitch matched up ass food. You know what I mean? A little cereal, or some old greens. Uh, oh, whatever. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. And I went down to the bed and I was grateful to get it. And I went down to the basement and I ate my little mitch matched food, man, and I nodded out. And when I woke up, they had a symbol. They had what they call a family intervention. Family intervention, right? And, the, and, and, and I'm asleep, but you know, I'm listening. I'm, I had an out of body experience, you know, because I'm listening to the conversation. I don't really want to open my eyes because the tenor of the conversation is so disturbing. They're talking about me like I don't exist. You understand? The family members. And the thing that got to me was I couldn't really, really react to anything because I knew that these were people who loved me. It wasn't like I was in the street, you know, and I could say, well, you know, they don't know me, they don't understand me. They really need to ask somebody who I am and this, that, and the other. No, these are family members who I knew loved me, who had raised me, but they were talking about me in the third person like, yeah, there he is. And they had called, like, like uh, uh, religious leaders and, 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 and um, um, politicians and, you know, just assembled the whole community, and they were talking about me like I was a specimen. They said, there he is. <laughs> That's him right there. Boy had a fine education. I don't understand what happened to him. I know his mother would be turning in her grave right now if she could see him. You know? And something in me wanted to jump up and fight and say, listen, you know, you, you, you can't talk about me like that. What are you doing inviting people I don't even know to stand over me like I'm sort of some sort of a science project? You know, but I ain't have any fight in me anymore. Right? Because I was tired of suffering. I was tired of suffering, and it was because of what they were saying that it let me uh, let me understand the fact that I was in such pain. Cause look, how about you run so long? How about you run so hard that you don't even realize you in the pain that you're in? How about other people have to tell you? You know, you are really fucked up. How about even when they tell you, you don't believe it? And you're talking to them, I'm all right. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, you lost so much weight. I always wanted to be this size. What do you mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? This is the way I like looking. I wanted to do this. This was a conscious decision. <laughs> and they said, no, Usman, nobody is this small in this family. <laughs> The babies in this family. Look, there goes my nephew right there. Look, you understand? There are no small little people in my family. 
The little people are bigger than most in my family. The same person who could get away with saying they're little in my family is big in life. You understand? There are no little people in my family. I'm going around talking about this is the way I want to look. You know, other people's clothes, other people's underwear, other people's shoes. You know, where do you get these clothes from? You know, I'm getting creative and everything. So the point about it is I was in such pain for so long that I didn't even realize the pain I was in. And how about this? How about you're in pain for so long that you become practiced? and stuff and pay. How about you use so long that you can't even afford, you might go into shock if you knew how much pain you was really in. You got to be detoxed into an understanding of how much pain you're in. They just can't give it to you all at once. They say, all right, here it comes. Now, easy does it. <laughs> Where you think these slogans come from? You know what I mean? Just look at him. He is really fucked up. Well, don't let him know. Look. Easy does it. Give time time. This is something we must earn, you know? This is a day at a time program, you know? Well, I lost everything. I lost my wife, my home, my house, my job, my kids. That's all right. Just take it easy. Don't try to tackle all of that at one time. We've been where you've been. We understand, but it's okay. This is a day at a time program just for the day. How do you eat an elephant a bite at a time? You know, we're going to take this on in little bite-sized morsels and you'll be all right. That's the condition I was in. I was in so much pain. And that's why we have to be so careful in recovery. You hear somebody for the first time, a fledgling newcomer, raising their hand in a shaky manner and trying to say something. And they know they're lying and you know they're lying, and, and, but they're trying. And you say, hey, get honest, God damn it. Almost crushing the spirit of the little newcomer, you know, because the little newcomer is trying to get honest to the best of their ability, you know what I mean? Because we didn't come in here brimming with honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And it's so important to allow somebody the process they need to try to just, you know, some people come in here and are trying honesty on for size. So what are they doing in that? Well, they're in there talking about things like honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. They say you can't even begin to get their way of life without that. So unless you're willing to try on honesty, you're in trouble because you can fool the baker and get another bun, but if you fool yourself, you wind up with none. They're talking about open-mindedness. You know, the mind works like a parachute. It works best when it's open. You know, and you're talking about a guy who was used to jumping out of a plane. You say, pull the cord, who's my? Maybe I will, maybe I won't. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know how to land on my feet. I don't need you to tell me how to land on my feet. I'm 38 years old. I've been landing on my feet my whole life. I don't need you to tell me how to pull a cord. I know I got a cord. I know it opens. I open it when I get good and damn ready. <laughs> so, you know, people don't necessarily come in here brimming with honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. It might be somebody like me. That even though they're in searing, white, hot pain, can't get honest about it. Can't get honest about it. Or what the fuck is the exact nature? Just get to the exact nature. How about it takes time to realize what is the exact nature? It's a 12-step program. You don't just come in here in touch with the exact nature of what's going on with you. You don't just come in here knowing how to be honest. How about you come like me from a long line of lying asses? That's my brother right there. He used to get so many ass whippings because I was such a good liar. Oh my God. He's talking about amends. He owes me. Resent. I owe him so many amends. He's all over my eight step list. Because of all the little ass whippings he got. I said, Ma, you know Mustafa did it. Yeah, I saw him go in your purse. <laughs> And he said, you know, if I didn't think they wouldn't come back here and whip my ass again, I'd fuck you up. <laughs> and I said, I'd teach you to be fucking with me, you know what I'm saying? Because you know they're going to believe me, so just shut up, you know. Oh, I'm talking about a long card-carrying liar. Practiced in lying. Card-carrying liar. Came from the kind of community where we were some kind of sick, proud of being liars. <laughs> you know, didn't even want you with us if you couldn't be a good liar. You know what I'm saying? 
We didn't want that. When we did our little stuff, we didn't want you, if you got caught, jump up and say, come on out, everybody. We caught. <laughs> come on out, everybody. Jigs up, we caught. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? If we did something and somebody got caught and interrogated, we wanted to know what, what, what happened. I just told them the truth. You did what? <laughs> what, did they beat you? No, I just went down there and told them the truth. We thought something was constitutionally wrong with them. The next thing we wanted to know, you didn't tell them the truth about me, did you? <laughs> I, hope you uh, I hope you kept that honest shit to yourself. You ain't let none of it spill over into me, you know? So I'm just saying, you know, that it take, all flowers don't bloom at the same time. And it's very important, you know, that we be tolerant and patient and loving with one another when we come in terms of talking about these things. Just because you see somebody in pain doesn't mean that they're ready to deal with it. You know, you see, you see the sister, she got the same black eyes she always has every time they have an argument, you know. Why don't you just leave his ass? She's not there. She needs some more black eyes. Because a person convinced against their own will is destined to be of the same opinion still. A lot of people knew I needed to surrender before I was in touch with it. This is a self-diagnosis program. You say, we say you are an addict when you say you are. I can't make you be an addict. Anybody with children, raise your hand. Anybody with children who have not picked up a substance but who has no doubt in their drug addict mind that they are raising the potential addict, raise your hand. That's me. I got kids and I can see addict behavior running all through them. They got it. They got it honestly. And it's there. It's just a question of to what degree it's going to surface and will God intervene in time before they are full-blown addict. But you can see addict behavior long before the person is in touch with the fact that they're an addict. You know? And, and so it's real important that we be understanding towards one another when we talk about you know, in other words, what I'm trying to say is even though we can see somebody in pain, we have to allow other people their pain. And even when they, we see them coming into recovery, we have to allow them their pain. We do, you know. One of the reasons is because it talks about it in our literature. It says that, you know, uh, each person, every person that comes to Narcotics Anonymous has paid a very dear price to get here. On page 10 in what is the NA program, the basic text it says, each of us has paid the price of membership. We have paid for the right to recover with our pain. You understand? So it's not a question of, of, of being, and this is why they say don't preach, judge, or moralize get self-righteous and condescending and you know you hear in the room so often well you ain't no real addict you talking that pipe shit that crack shit I shot dope I'm a real addict and then the crackheads say you ain't no real addict cause that shit you did you could do for 20 years fuck with some crack <laughs> you think you bad <laughs> no no, but I'm making a point about misfits judging misfits. Yeah. It's something real insane about us collectively coming together and trying to compare war stories. There's a reason they say, you know, we're not interested in all of that. How much, how little you had, who your connections were. What do you want to do about your problem? Did you suffer pain and misery? Did you suffer? Talk to us on the level of feelings. That's why they say it costs nothing to belong here, but you must pay attention. It costs nothing to have no fees or dues or pledges of any kind. And it costs nothing to belong here, but you must pay attention. I must pay attention to your pain when you're sharing. I must pay attention to a point where I'm not interested in the fact that you're white. I'm not interested in the fact that you're black. I'm not, it makes me so angry, man, when I see people, areas, groups, conventions, 
divided along bullshit, racial lines and what have you because the fact of the matter is all of that is irrele irrelevant. This is an equal opportunity destroyer we're dealing with here. Doesn't matter whether you're from Park Avenue or the Park Bench. You know, I'm talking about paying attention to where I don't see that you're a woman. I don't see that you're a man. I don't see that you're straight. I don't see that you're gay. I don't see that you're HIV positive. I don't see that you're HIV negative. It doesn't matter. Paying attention to where I'm down to the level of feelings. Like the young kids say, do you feel me? You don't have to be a woman to feel a woman's pain. You don't have to be a man to feel somebody's pain. You don't have to share somebody's religion or any of that stuff to feel their pain. I remember in early recovery, my sponsor said, did you go to me? Yeah, said, well, how'd, you, how'd you like it? Well, you know, they had so-and-so, this type of addict there, and they were sharing that you missed the money. Next night, did you go to me? Yeah, what'd you get out? Well, you know, the sister was there, and she was sharing this, blah, 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 blah. You missed the money. You missed the money. You wasn't listening hard enough. That's why they talk about learning to listen and listening to learn. You got to learn to listen. You're not supposed to listen through comparison. You're supposed to listen through identification. Do you understand where the person was coming from? You understand? They jerked X amount of money, and because you jerked Y, you, you, know, you can't relate because you didn't jerk X and you jerked Y. Can you relate to jerking? <laughs> That's what, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about, you know. So, so pain, pain is a deep thing, you know. And, and, and the pain we're talking about here is deep because it's, it's, it's circular. It's circular. I want to read a couple of things because I don't have a literature phobia, right? So I want to break a couple of things off here <laughs> through, our NA, through our NA literature, you know, because I want to make a point, right? I want to make a point. Uh, uh, uh. I want to make a point. It says on page 14, why are we here? We were addicts and didn't know it. Through drugs, we tried to avoid reality, pain, and misery. So stick with me now. So I'm an addict. I may not be in touch with it. All I know is I got to have something different. That's all I know. And then I get the bright idea, the brilliant idea that I just might find it in drugs. Brilliant. Somewhere deep, deep, deep down in my nature, I'm in touch with the fact that I'm a long way from home, right? I'm a long way from that identic state I, I talked about. I know I need something different than what I'm getting out of life. I know what I've gotten in the habit of serving up to myself is not going to sustain me. And this feeling is so painful that I think that I can treat it with drugs. So I try the drugs. Only to find, only to find that using the drugs causes me pain and I realize I need to try to stay clean. And then like it says on page seven, you reach a point where you give up the hope that you could ever stop using. And our attempts to stay clean always fail, causing us pain and misery. So I pick up the drugs to avoid pain and misery. And now when I try to stop using the drugs, what I get, pain and misery. You understand? That's why, that's why I'm grateful for my whole process because that routine was circular. I'm using the drugs to avoid pain and misery. If I stop using the drugs, what I get? Pain and misery. I need now a power greater than myself to help me get up out of this hopeless dilemma. I'm in the grip of a hopeless dilemma. That's what I just described to you was another way of describing being in the grip of a hopeless dilemma. I can't deal with life without using drugs. 
If I stop using drugs, I can't deal with life. What am I to do? Go on the best I can to the bitter ends or try the new way to live, right? And that's where this program comes in. That's where this program comes in because it gives me a vehicle with which to address the pain that I've come to embrace, right? It tells me, listen, first of all, here's what you got to do. Stop using. What? Don't pick it up. What? Yeah, first step stuff. Because if you don't pick it up, you can't get high. You know, don't be laying on the railroad track worrying about the caboose. It's the first car that's going to bust your ass. Get out the way. Don't pick it up so you can have a shot. You know? And then, listen, that's when it gets real, real funky. Because that's when you get introduced to your personal void. And many is the addict. That's why people go out, all right, in a nutshell. They stop using and they look down at the void. The big ass cabinet Grand Canyon looking void at the drug field. <clears throat> and when they look at that big ass Grand Canyon dimension sized void where the drugs went, they say, I can't make it. So come on, we're going to do this together. You go. <laughs> you, you go. I can't make it. The void is too deep. It looks too perilous. I can't even imagine making the attempt. They said, listen, all you need to do is be thorough and sincere. All you need to do is give your best effort. Just try. I don't believe I can make it. Well, can you believe that we believe? Can you allow me to be a vision of your hope? Let me be your vision. Can I be your vision? Can you believe that I believe you can make it? Will you let us love you till you learn to love yourself? Could you just not hurt yourself? Just give yourself a break just for the day. I hear you, I understand you, but I don't believe that I can make it. Well, listen, how about coming to believe as a process? Why don't you just keep coming back, right? And then you'll allow yourself to be in a position for all the ultimates. Huh? Why don't you come to where, you know, why don't you come to uh, the most powerful vehicle, the ultimate vehicle? Why don't you ride the ultimate vehicle, a meeting? Come to a meeting. Why? Because there you'll find the ultimate weapon, another recovering addict. And if you really listen, you can hear the ultimate authority, God speaking through the ultimate weapon. Why don't you give yourself a break, Usman? Just believe that we believe. And it's through that process, it's the process of coming to believe that will restore you to sanity that will make you understand you don't need the drugs and you can make it. And then if you keep coming back, guess what will happen? What? If you keep coming back, you'll be given the gift of discrimination. That's a monster move for an addict who can't tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong, who buys his own commercial, to whom nonsense makes good sense, to whom it makes sense to pay, spend all the money, on the rent money, food money, the phone money, everybody's money and then be wondering why he's evicted. That's some big shit. You know, come to believe, and guess what? Not only will you get the gift of discrimination, but when your belief is grown, you'll be well on your way to deciding once again to have God be your greatest source of strength and courage. And like the last line in the third step says, just because you make that decision doesn't mean you're there yet. See, all you did was position yourself to be ready for your first honest self-appraisal, which you can begin with step four. 
Point is, it might be a good time to introduce you to you. It might be a good time to meet the person who's been causing you the pain. We suggest you put down your blame thrower. <laughs> you know, because you're coming in recovery and you want to blame Lottie Dottie and everybody. It's sorting through the contradiction and confusion known as your life. What are you confused about? What your greatest source of strength and courage is? What to worship? Who to worship? When to worship? You're running around talking about you've been to college, you've been this, you've been there, and this, that, and the other, and who you are. And then meanwhile, back at the ranch, you worshiping coke and dope. You are confused. Anybody, and worship just means to give your all to something. So if you're putting all your hope and your wishes and your dreams in coke and dope, you are a confused somebody. And you need to sort through that and figure out how did you come to confuse coke and dope with Almighty God. A sponsor is indicated because I needed a sponsor so that I could get with not just the most obvious but the less obvious symptoms of my disease. The sponsor said, listen, your number one problem is drugs, okay? Drugs. Drugs. Don't be running around talking about, I don't know what'll make me use. Drugs. Drugs. Okay? News flash, scoop, bulletin, drugs. If you use, you'll use drugs. If you use, you will make a decision to pick up and that's what you'll be using, drugs. Right? Don't even play and put yourself like that. I don't know what to make me use and this, that, and the other. Your number one problem is drugs, buddy. Drugs ain't my problem today, you know, I'm, uh, hey, I got a life, yeah, yeah, fuck with some drugs. <laughs> See how much of a life outside of NA you'll have. Number two problem is anything that makes you think about going back to number one. Anything. So you can fill in your own blanks. Don't be sitting up here comparing my story to yours. Saying, I, I can't relate to that speaker. Look at your own life. Take your own inventory. Figure out what causes you pain, misery, and suffering to the point where you feel backed up in the corner. You can't get out of clean to where you want to double up in a fetal position and don't open the blinds, take the phone off the hook, and not call anybody. What rocks your boat in the middle of the night? Don't worry about my story. What makes you consider going back to your number one problem? Who have you confused with your greatest source of strength and courage? You hear addicts every day talking about it. Look, I don't know. If my man leaves, my woman leaves, all bets are off. My mama dies, my daddy dies, I just don't know. Because I don't know what will make me use. Well, this is a pretty good time to figure it out. <laughs> sort through that. Sort through it. And if you can't do it by yourself, that's why they say do it with a sponsor, somebody you can trust, who you have confidence in, who has integrity and character, right? And can help you with the priorities of your life, can help you order your relationships so that you get back to God, yourself, and everything else is pretty much conversation. Because if you can figure those first two out, if you can figure out where your greatest source of strength and courage is, and then you make a decision to get entirely ready to go to that, let God be your go-to guy. And get humble as you need to get to do it, you're well on your way. Well on your way. Give up your victim status. My brother and Salam were talking about resentments. Let them go. Because you can't move forward looking backwards. Can't be done. You don't drive like that. You, your eyes not riveted to the rear view mirror. The most important part of your journey is the road right in front of you. It's the same thing. Give up the victim status. Right? and concentrate on the hand that God's given you to play. And where there's a wrong, admit it, make amends, do what you need to do, right? And do a 10th step, give yourself the privilege of thinking. You need to give yourself the privilege of thinking if you want to, on a continuous basis, not go back to old pain and misery. The literature talks about it, this is none of my stuff, the literature talks about sometimes there's a distorted sense of security in familiar pain. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes there's, a, there's a, the feeling that uh, because 
this is so new, maybe I need to go back to my familiar pain. My marriage ended, right? Let me inject some real life funnies into this. My marriage ended and what happens is, what happens is other people, you know, because I have so many friends, I know so many nice loving couples and it is sometimes, <laughs> I do, I do. You know, if you know a lot of nice couples and shit, you want to be a nice loving couple. You want to be all coupled up couple up your ass into the banquet? You want to talk about better halves and shit? You see people making it as a couple, as a unit? And you sometimes wonder, well, where's my unit? Where's my couple? I want to be in a couple. And even if you're not thinking like that, even if through the grace of God you had enough, because sometimes you have to be able to recognize God's grace when it comes to you. Sometimes it's through grace that God will move you away from somebody. He will give you signs to let you know, this is not the one, buddy. I don't care what kind of icing you want to put on the cake. This ain't the one. Smart money says, make a move. If you stay stuck like Chuck, it's on you. I'm giving you a way out. Right? But then other people will begin to suggest to you, you all right? Have you really tried? I mean, have you really tried to make it work? You try to make that shit work. I'm done. I'm done and can be all right with it. I'm trying to describe wherein you come to appreciate that God is your greatest source of strength and courage and you don't have to go back to familiar pain. You don't have to go back to distortion just because it's familiar or just because other people think that they think that that's what's best for you. Sometimes the pain of growing through, sometimes the pain of growing through some new stuff is better for you than going back and rehashing some old stuff. It's not etched in concrete, you know? So I'm sharing this for anybody who's in a position like me and who finds themselves being taken to new ground. I'm saying it's all right. It's all right to grow through what you need to grow through, even though it's painful. Even though it's painful, you know? In order for the hidden splendor of a diamond to be released, it's got to be cut. Left alone, it's just a lump of looking like coal. But it has to be cut by a master gemologist. God is the master of all masters. And sometimes when he cuts me, it's painful. And I don't look like what I looked like before he started working on me. Because I'm going through something. Sometimes when God is trying to fashion you in the kind of instrument he wants to make of you, it's painful. It's painful. And it's all right. If you wanted to make a, a sharp knife, you don't put it in a blue heat, the red heat, the yellow heat. You got to put it in the searing white hot heat. Right? And then you got to take it out of the heat and put it into the ice cold. Heat to cold. And sometimes when you're growing through stuff, that's how your feelings go, from hot to cold. And then after you take it from the hot to cold, the hot to cold, the hot to cold process, then you got to take it out and guess what you got to do? You got to beat it. So sometimes when you are growing and getting better, you feel like you're getting beat down. Doesn't feel good always to be growing through some pain, but it's all right. 
more be revealed. As we grow, we come to understand humility is acceptance of both our assets and our liabilities. What we want most is to feel good about ourselves. Today we have real feelings of love, joy, hope, sadness, excitement. Our feelings are not our old drug-induced feelings. So never go up to somebody because they're growing through something, right? And try to make them think that they're crazy because they look happy. You still not with your wife? No. You all right? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. I mean, how do you really feel? I, no, no, no. You can get honest with me, boo. How are you, how are you really feeling? God damn it, I told you I feel all right. If somebody feels all right, let them be all right. The literature says it. You know, we don't just have, when, look, when you don't have the drug-induced feelings anymore, listen, here's the thing. At the same time, you can feel love. You can still love somebody, but recognize that you shouldn't be with them. Those are not mutually exclusive concepts. You can still love somebody, realize that you shouldn't be with them, and feel joy about having the strength of resolve to move on. You can love somebody, be joyous about having decided to move on, and still feel somewhat sad in some ways, because it wasn't all bad, right? You can feel love, joy, sadness, still have hope, and be excited than a motherfucker. Huh. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. You can love somebody, be somewhat sad that it's over. At the same time, live happy, joyous, and free, right? And still be excited in a motherfucker. Because <laughs> they say, when one door closes, another one opens. Unless you're the kind of addict who chooses to catch hell in the hallway. <laughs> chooses to catch hell in the hallway, always so concerned about opening up the closed chapter. Revisiting those thrilling ass days of yesteryear, you got the baby. Let me back in. Let me back in. Who you seeing? I know you still love me. You can't even see the brand new vistas God's trying to open up before you. He's trying to open up whole new chapters in your life. You can't even see them because you got your tunnel vision and you're fixated on what was. Running around talking that yester was stuff instead of getting with what's now. You know, so listen, pain is inevitable. If you're on this journey, pain is inevitable because it takes a lot of hard work to get to where we're talking about in the 11th step where we come in contact with that fierce little four letter word called only. This is the word. <laughs> Wait a minute, let's stick right here for a second. Break all this literature down. Yeah. Basic text, work time wise, just for the day, any new ass literature you can put your hands on. The fiercest word that you will come across in all NA literature. Throw in any literature from any other fellowship if you want to. The fiercest word that you'll ever come across is that four letter word only. Because it takes big boy and big girl work to get to a point. Where the only thing you want, you don't believe it takes a lot of work? Honestly, ask yourself right now if the only thing you want is not God knows how to carry that out. And be real honest with yourself. And you guess what'll happen? It'd be like on a computer, a whole ticket tape full of bullshit will print out. <laughs> Make me want to say. You understand? Make me want to say. I don't care how hard you work. Make real honest with yourself and ask yourself, is it true for me that that's the only thing I want? Is that the only thing I want? No, I mean, for real. Honestly ask yourself that question and you'll get in touch with, no, you know, I want a whole bunch of shit, God. Come on, God. I ain't there yet. I ain't there yet, God. 
huh? I ain't ready to turn that corner. You know, I read the six steps. They said, why well, ask for something before I'm ready for it, right? I want this, 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 this. Let's make a deal, God, huh? <laughs> so it takes a lot of work to get to that point, right? I want to close with another story. I told you the story about the guy on the search for the meaning of life going up the mountain. This is a story about three monks. This is my three monk story. There's three monks, right? And uh, three spiritual monks. Well, a monk, I guess, is spiritual by definition. We hope, right? You could be an unspiritual monk, right? I don't know what's going on under the monk outfit. But anyway, <laughs> these are three spiritual monks. All right? This is my story, so they're spiritual monks. Three spiritual monks, and, uh, and, and, and they all, they all profess to be at that 11th step stage. They all profess to have come to terms with only. All three monks, right? And, and they were tight monks, they all, they, you know, because there's very few people to reach that stage of enlightenment. So they kind of hung out together, right? And they went around looking enlightened and everything. And every day they'd meditate. And they had their little area and their little spot in the park where they meditated on a daily basis. And everybody knew that at a certain time of day, the three monks would be there meditating. One day, the three monks were in position doing their normal meditation thing, right? And a nut came along. Let's just say he was a nut for brevity's sake, right? So the nut comes along and he says, Look at these supposed to be so spiritual ass monks. I bet you ain't never one of them spiritual, really. I'm gonna see how spiritual they really are. They talking about this only business. I bet if I knocked the shit out of them, they wouldn't be talking that only stuff, right? <laughs> so the nut goes up to the first monk. Punched the monk as hard as he could. And the monk jumped up. Said, boy, I'm going to beat your ass with the wrath of God. You don't put your hands on a spiritual man. You know, all I want is knowledge for God's will. And you came and you interrupted that. Now, I got to serve you. Kind of like you be in recovery and claim to be spiritual and everything like that. You know what I'm saying? And then somebody steps on your new suede shoes and then you say, see, now you done fucked up. You know what I mean? I'm always all right, but now you, uh, you, you done fucked up now. You know, them $400 shoes and uh, I got to kick your ass now. Didn't want to do it. Now I'm, and, they, and the, the literature says don't get too angry. They said nothing about justifiably angry, but you know, if you got fake third monk status, that's what you do. You come up with justifiable anger. So the first monk was in the justifiable anger, right? He said, I can justifiably lose my only status, right? So the guy came back a couple weeks later, three monks still in position. He said, all right, I done tried the first monk. He fake like that, multi phasing like he was free. Let me try the second monk. Bam! <laughs> hit the second monk twice as hard as he hit the first monk. The second monk said, "Oh my God! Ooh, ooh, you don't, boy, you don't know how close you came." Mm. I'm a work a program though. <laughs> like he's doing him a favor, right? You know how we do, right? Motherfucker, you lucky I got a program. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear to God, you, not I'm lucky I got a program. No, you lucky I got a program. So you don't know. You better, next time, you better ask somebody who I am, because you lucky I got a program. That was the second month did. So the nut came back a few weeks later, right? And... He said, all right, I tried monk number one, monk number two. Let's see what this third monk is all about, you know, because these first two were definitely multi facing if you ask me. You call me the nut, they all faking the funk. So like, bam! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he really hit the third monk. 
he hit the third monk three times harder than he hit the first two monks, because he was practicing a little bit, right? <laughs> Knocking out monks and shit, right? So he hit the third monk, bam! The third monk didn't even budge. Didn't break his monk meditation. Didn't acknowledge even being punched. Because he was truly at a point where he realized suffering is optional. In other words, if you really raise your consciousness, you will realize nobody can make me suffer but me. You need my full-fledged permission for me to suffer. And unless I give it to you, I'm all right. That's the challenge. Now let's, let's get something straight. I do not profess to be anywhere near third monk status. I got a long way to go. I'll be the first to say it. You know, it's just that I understand a few things a little better than I did before, but I, I'm not there, you know. But uh, I do know that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, and that if anyone, if anyone truly tries to internalize these principles in their life, they'll be well on their way to moving away from not only pain, but suffering as well, right? And what God has done, God can do. And where he has lifted up pain and suffering from one, he can do it for two. If I've said anything that makes any sense, Please credit it to the God of my understanding. If I said anything that was off color, unbeautiful, or disturbing, I apologize. I'm an addict. My name is Usman, and thanks for having me.